Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Promises to be another exciting session of the Spark Festival. 165 events across two weeks is just incredible. So congratulations to uh, Maxine and to Maria uh, for all the effort that's gone in and a lot of excitement uh, has been generated. Um, none more so than obviously tonight with uh, Scott joining us. ACS is a professional body for tech workers. Uh, our vision is for Australia to be a world leader in technology talent, fostering innovation and creating new forms of value. And so anything that we can do uh, to achieve that goal, um, we will. And the reason why we're particularly interested uh, in the Spark Festival, we understand that the nature of the firm is changing, organisational charts are thinning out, and that jobs grow for a digital economy and a modern economy comes from the small to medium enterprise. Uh, in recent times, you may have seen that ACS has uh, opened up here at Barangaroo. We've got a three to four person accelerator scale up. So if you've got a tech platform that you want to take global, please see us a little bit later and we'll see if we can help you with uh, the financial services and professional services sector down here at Darling Harbour. You might have also heard that recently we required um, River City Labs. So that was a big one for us. Um, Steve Baxter's uh, baby in Queensland and uh, there's lots of um, investment tours coming up but Steve's leading a few himself. Um, the ability to fund tech talent going overseas to learn from places like Israel and uh, Silicon Valley and the like. Um, and we really want to have that conversation. If you're a business leader, we also want to be able to put you in contact with ACS's tech talent. So we have 45,000 members, individuals, not companies. Uh, they're right across the globe. Um, and we really want to be able to empower you to make your vision come to life. Lots of business analysts, lots of project managers, but lots of software engineers. And uh, you would have seen it as a key issue in the startup muster survey. Um, just this week where 23% of founders said that they were really strong in software development and firmly believe you're going to need tech to be able to take your ideas global. So we're really thrilled to be here. I'm just going to read a brief bio. While Scott needs no introduction, uh, it is always good to reflect on success and how he might inspire uh, others in this room. So Atlassian is currently servicing more than 120,000 large and small organisations across the world including companies like ANZ, Citrix, Domino's, Qantas, Twilio and Visa. In 2015, one of the key reasons we're here tonight is that Scott helped spearhead Pledge 1%, a corporate philanthropy movement dedicated to making the community a key stakeholder in every business. Um, just uh, in terms of reflection on achievements, in 2006, both Scott and co-founder and co-CEO Mike Cannon-Brooks were awarded AFR's Australian Business Person of the Year and in Forbes 2017 named them on the Global Game Changers list. Scott's going to be interviewed tonight by Mark Reading, head of the Foundation for Atlassian. Please make them welcome. Hi everyone, good evening. Um, thanks very much Andrew. Um, before we uh, begin I'd actually like to pay my respects to the, uh, the traditional custodians of the land upon which we're gathered tonight, the, uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and to pay our respects to Elders past, present and future. <coughs> Tonight's going to be pretty informal. Um, it's very much an Ask Me Anything uh, session uh, with Scott. Um, he's open to, to any question. He'll do his best to, to give you a, a really honest answer. Um, I'm going to kick things off by just asking a few questions um, in, in a few different areas. Uh, those three areas are sort of Scott's personal background. Let's get to know him a little bit uh, personally. A um, little bit about the, the history of Atlassian, in particular the early days. Um, we've got a number of founders in the room. And so uh, your, your reflections on your early days in particular, I think, might be uh, particularly interesting and insightful. And then uh, thirdly, the, uh, the Atlassian Foundation and, and Pledge 1%. That's a really important part of the, uh, the DNA of Atlassian and uh, I'm really keen to, to get some personal insights there. Um, once I've asked those few questions or questions in those few areas, uh, we're going to throw it open to, to you to ask uh, whatever you want. We're going to have uh, two roaming mics. Um, my request of you when you're asking a question is uh, please uh, stand up. Um, make sure you've got the mic before you start speaking. Um, we're actually video streaming tonight, so it'll make it much easier for, for those people who are listening online to actually uh, hear the question as well as the answer and save Scott having to repeat each question. Um, but other than that, it's uh, very, very informal. So, um, Scott, um, personally, can you um, sort of share with us a little bit about your, your life story, I guess? Um, <laughs> Um, 
you, wh 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 where were you raised? You know, what are your memories of childhood? How many siblings did you have? Just sort of yep. tell us a bit about you, the person, and, yep. you, and you begin with your early days. Yeah, well, firstly, thank you everyone for coming here. I think you've all paid five dollars to be here, so I really appreciate, <laughs> really appreciate that investment. And uh, six dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it's 35, some of you paid with Visa and some of you paid with MasterCard. Okay. Um, and uh, my family story started when my, um, my, my father and my mother loved each other very, very much. <laughs> <laughs> and about nine months later, uh, I came into the world. Uh, so I grew up in uh, Castle Hill, which back then when I grew up was a small little country town a long way from anywhere. Is anyone here from tonight from Castle Hill, the Hills District? A few people, yeah, it's a, it was a long way. It took like an hour and a half to get uh, back there uh, when I grew up. It had three fish and chip shops in the same street. Uh, two of them burnt down the same night, which was a little bit, <coughs> um, a little bit bizarre. Uh, and then I went to, uh, you know, the local primary school and I ended up going to a, a selective high school called James Roos, uh, which has been quite well known, I guess, in the press as being one of the uh, most selective uh, schools in, in the state. So uh, I was really lucky to have an education there. Um, where you get to do agriculture and you get to learn how to um, rear sheep and cows and um, they still have that today. So, you know, in rural Carlingford, in Carlingford there's, you know, sort of still paddocks where uh, sheep and cows are, are being uh, grown. And uh, then I went to the University of New South Wales. Um, so I should say, like, I'm a family of six, so I'm the oldest of four children, boy, girl, girl, boy. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then I went to, uh, to University of New South Wales. Uh, I almost went to the Australian Defence Force Academy, actually. I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I grew up. I had loved computers when I was a child. Um, we, didn't we couldn't really afford computers back then. Like they, were, like they were quite expensive, and uh, we, we couldn't really afford one. So I do remember my dad brought home uh, old Wang hand-me-downs, like these computers that, um, that they were throwing out at work and they were kind of useless. And, uh, but as a kid, all I wanted to do was play computer games. Um, but it turned out these WAN computers were slightly incompatible uh, with every computer game that was out there. Um, <laughs> but it took me about two years to work that out. And uh, I think that was my introduction to computing, uh, was trying to get computer games working uh, over a long period of time at home. And uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I didn't know what I wanted to do after, after school. I, I, I signed up for engineering and uh, I got a scholarship to go to the Australian Defence Force Academy. And as luck would have it, my uh, final acceptance letter got lost in the post. <laughs> uh, literally lost in the post. It turned up three months later uh, uh, after I'd already accepted uh, a different uh, a scholarship at Uni University of New South Wales. Um, so I turned up at uh, University of New South Wales with a BIT course. Um, is anyone UNSW here? Sort of. Wow, we're really underrepresented. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't, af couldn't afford it. Oh, I was just wondering, uh, anyone from UNSW here? Good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well done. I did a master's down in urban planning at New South Wales University and I did a uh, degree in architecture. So, uh, you should come up here. Yeah. We've been here. Uh, <laughs> so, it sounds like your story is way more fascinating. Um, All right. Well, that, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, this uh, is combined um, business uh, uh, science degree, so business IT degree. Um, and back then, all the IT subjects were pretty horrific, actually. It was all very much almost like library studies. It was, you know, information architecture and how to, you know, sort of a lot of academic papers. Um, and then we did the sort of half business, half, uh, sci half uh, computing. And that was really good because we get to meet uh, you know, a lot of people from around, you know, Australia. Like, it's a scholarship course that attracted people from country, you know, New South Wales and a lot of people from very rich schools uh, in the eastern suburbs um, and, you know, people like myself from, uh, you know, public schools uh, uh, across New South Wales. And so that was fascinating to go to university and have the um, people from very different socioeconomic backgrounds come together uh, to do the scholarship course. And as part of that course, you do three lots of industrial training. Uh, and what that is is sort of a co-op course. So you take a three-year degree, make it four years and do 18 months of work experience. Those doing the math means you lose six months of your school holidays, you know, university holidays in order to work. Um, and you get paid a, a certain amount every week, regardless of whether you're working or whether you're at university. So the first year when you're a full-time student and you're getting paid, you know, $300 a week, I think it was back then, it's like amazing. And then when you're working full-time and you're getting paid $300 a week, it's not so, <laughs> not so amazing. Um, and I did uh, three uh, industrial trainings, probably long enough, no, no, now, long enough ago now I can name them. Uh, but we, I did one for at, uh, 
Uh, my first one was at, uh, let me think which order it was, um, IBM. Uh, and uh, those of you may not remember, I'm maybe too, too young, there was a year 2000 thing where, you know, go back 20 years, everyone was really worried the that the Y2K world, bug. world would fall over with the Y2K bug. And uh, my job at IBM at the time was, wasn't to fix the Y2K bug, uh, that, that was probably beyond my pay grade. It was to review every contract and make sure that IBM was not legally liable <laughs> um, if they had any problems. <laughs> and uh, after about three months doing that, I, it sounds very cliche, but I swear it's true, I was at the water cooler, which is on the other side of the floor I was on in Chatswood, and I was chatting with someone, you know, what do you do, what do you do? And it turned out there was someone else doing the exact same project on the other side of the floor for just a different part of IBM. And of course, it's much more efficient to do it once than it was two things. So I ended up handing that off to someone else. <laughs> um, and go I left for the day, actually. Um, <laughs> and, and then my second industrial training was at the Australian Stock Exchange. And that was a few years later, so it was the middle of the dot-com boom, uh, when the Australian Stock Exchange was probably the top five website in all of Australia, which is kind of crazy to think that you know, people used to go there and refresh their stock prices that many times a, a day. And uh, you know, there were parts of the ASX that were run incredibly well. Like, you know, it's, if you think about it, it never goes down. Uh, it's always up, it you know, controls trillions of dollars of transactions. It's a pretty impressive piece of technology. Uh, but the e-commerce team was, you know, 25-year-old kids basically, you know, playing around. Um, and uh, it was interesting to see the dichotomy between sort of the old school, very process-based, uh, you know, people that ran things very, very well, and then the hot, and cool, sexy e-commerce team that really didn't know what they were doing, kind of slapped stuff together or went down every day, like, but everyone wanted to be in the hot, cool, sexy, cool, you know, like, hot thing, even though they had the worst practices. Um, and then after that, I, uh, I, uh, my third industrial training I went to, Price Waterhouse Coopers, um, and uh, we worked on the Sydney Water Billing Project. It was SIBS, the Combined Information Billing System, and uh, in that project, um, it was. I don't know if everyone working consulting, but you know, one of those projects you turn up and on your first day, you're like, "This is not going very well." And as a undergraduate university student, if I can pick that up, I, mean, I guess is that it was probably p pretty prevalent. Um, the room we we lived in, 24 hours, well. 20 hours a day, but long hours was a bit like this, but without the, the lights. Like it was sort of a dungeon um, area with no natural lighting. And uh, the project, um, it turned out they'd chosen IBM for one bit of the software, and then they'd chosen uh, Web's, uh, WebLogic for th and the other bit. And of course, you know, I don't know why you'd get two different vendors that don't talk to each other to add risk to the project, but there was some business reason that didn't quite work out. And anyway, so it was ridiculously inefficient to do things. And during that time, I downloaded some open source software and I ended up being way more uh, efficient. Many of you, I presume from the ACS here, many of you are programmers or understand that. Um, there's a thing called a dev cycle, you know, which is basically how fast between you writing code can you see it working or, or test it. And back then it might have been about five minutes where you'd save something, go to you know, a whole bunch of incantations and five minutes later you'd get to go test whether that thing you did worked or not. And I got it to instant, so I basically just, you know, alt tab and it would be instant. So I suddenly became the most productive programmer. Um, but when they found out that's what I was doing, they said, don't do that. Um, it might not work in production, so you should really go down and just do the slow thing with everyone else. <laughs> um, that project ended up in the largest lawsuit ever um, in professional services history in Australia. Um, I think still to this day, uh, it was a $150 million uh, contract that got uh, litigated. I don't know who won in, in the end. Um, but anyway, that, that was my experience of three big companies. And um, so when I uh, was going to graduate from UMSW, I thought, well, what do I want to do? And getting a job offer from one of those three companies wasn't really high on my list, just from the experience I'd had <laughs> in an un undergraduate. And so contrary to, you know, these days it feels like startups have a, um, a bit of an allure, a mystique. There's a lot of people that are interested in it. We've got festivals like Spark Festival. Uh, but back then, it really was just, there was no career path. Like, no one, I didn't know anyone that had worked in a startup. Uh, I didn't know anyone working in venture capital. I couldn't name any startups. Uh, and so for us, it was just a matter of not wanting to get a real job somewhere else and thought, if we can earn $48,500, which was the graduate PwC salary at the time, uh, if we can earn that much and not have to wear a suit to work, then we'd be doing pretty well. And, uh, and we did a few different things I can talk about that later, but um, eventually produced our first product called Jira, which was, uh, has been quite successful. It's still 17 years later, like still a very popular um, piece of software. And then produced other products when we acquired people and so forth. And Before you get too far into yeah. the Atlassian story, um, whereabouts on this journey did you meet Mike and uh, 
what were your first impressions? Uh, so I met Mike at university. So um, was I went to James Roos, a public school in Carlingford, and he went to Cranbrook, uh, which is one of the most prestigious um, schools in New South Wales. Um, and I, mean, I guess expensive. I don't know how you measure prestige other ways. Um, <laughs> the most expensive <laughs> school. Uh, and uh, so it was just very different you know, uh, I experiences. And uh, Mike, Mike is quite proud that his grades degraded every single time. Like, so his, you know, w computer 1A was his highest mark, and then every year <laughs> it was monotonically <laughs> decreasing. Um, but he was one of those people that you wanted to be on his, uh, in university, what you want to go on group assignments with the smart people. Uh, and he was one of the, the smart people you wanted to get on group assignments with. So um, that, and you want to be on the group assignments with an organizer who just organizes it all. So you don't have to do that much. So. Uh, Anyway, so him and I, uh, we, we probably weren't the closest of friends at university. We got along well, and we met each other because of that open source um, software I used when I was working at PwC was similar to something he was using, and so we conversed a lot. And uh, I've still got the email when he, he said, hey, well, let's not get a real job when we graduate university, and let's do this, uh, this other thing. And uh, there's actually more than just the two of us on the email thread. Um, there's, there was about five people, and one by one they sort of said yes, and then they dropped out, and, and so it ended up just being the two of us. Gotcha. Okay. And so then you, you created Jira, and um, what are your memories of those early days? Uh, I was just walking um, today, actually. We were on 342 Kent Street, which was a, uh, an office we were subletting uh, from another um, a friend, and uh, they had uh, maybe a dozen people in their company, and it was you know, an old warehouse style, um, and probably back before the anyone spent money to make it cool, like it was warehouses in. The floors had gaps through them so you could see down you know, to the floor below. The lift had one of those old school click, click clank ones, like where you really had to close the lift and not with a fancy door on the inside that prevented you from losing your fingers, like just the, the, like the click clack thing. Um, at night, we, we would code overnight. It, was, it got so cold there because there was no heating. We'd, um, well Mike taught me a trip, trick, which was you run the hot water on the, on, the, on the tap and you go run your hands under hot water for you know, five minutes and then you can come back and you can keep typing because <laughs> otherwise your hands sort of like get um, turn into claws. And so, uh, anyway, I mean, it's, it's weird because, you know, I think at the time you're like, oh, I'm coding in this cold warehouse and no one's here at four in the morning. And then these days you're like, man, I was coding in this cold warehouse at four in the morning. <laughs> you know, like there's sort of the stories that, that come, that come uh, you know, are the good old days uh, are later. And, uh, you know, we moved, um, I think our, our, uh, our first, you know, we, we built this product, probably took us three to six months to build and it probably took us three to six months to get our first customer after that. And uh, I think our, our first sale was for $800, uh, but we felt that way that was a lot of money. So we gave an early adopter discount and it was $600. Um, so, and which was a lot of, I mean, that was two weeks salary back then, uh, you know, a week each, I guess. So that was a lot of money, but it seemed like a ridiculous amount of money for people to pay for something written by two university students that technically hadn't graduated by that stage. Um, Yes, we did that. Then, you know, our first employee was a backpacker named Owen. And uh, Owen was, you know, this maybe a year later, uh, we you know, had a few customers and Owen was literally backpacking, staying at, I think it's Scary Canary is what it's called now. Um, <laughs> on Kent Street. On Kent Street, yeah. yeah uh, he was staying there. And I think he was working in a pub and complaining to friends back home and I oh, maybe I should get a job in software. And they said, oh, there's a company called Atlassian. We use it. I think they're in Sydney. You should go check, check them out. And so Owen just came up the clickety clack lift and you know turned up and said, "Hey, I saw Lassie in here." And we were like two guys in the back, and he said, "Do you have a job? I'm looking for a job." And I said, "No, we don't have a job, but it's lunchtime. We should go to the pub." <laughs> and <laughs> a few hours later, we had our first employee. <laughs> um, and uh, and then Owen moved out of the backpackers and uh, slept on my floor for um, for a long time. <laughs> and uh, so it was true sort of, you know, startup, startup spirit. And uh, then we, I think we employed like three more backpackers. They were really, they were really good. They didn't, you didn't pay them much. Because um, <laughs> it was better than working, you know, yeah. at nights uh, in, a, in a bar. And uh, yeah, so we, we grew that, we grew the company. Um, we, you know, we, I think the stats, like we, we were two people down there. We're about two and a half thousand people uh, now. And so, you know, it seems like weird because that's a large difference. But every year it only grows, you know, 100% or 50% but it you know, just compounds over time. Yep. Okay. Uh, one of the things, ob obviously as the head of the foundation, one of the things that um, inspires me about uh, Scott and Mike was the fact that um, so early on in the history of Atlassian, um, you, and, you and Mike 
sort of recognised that um, the right thing to do was to was to bake giving back into the business. Mm. Um, I f personally find that quite staggering. That um, you know, back in 2004, 2005, I don't know exactly when it was, but back in the you know the days when corporate responsibility wasn't a big thing, and and you know there wasn't a, a whole sort of uh, social impact movement and uh, social entrepreneurs and things like that. That uh, that the two of you decided that uh, that was something you wanted to do. Can you just share with us a little bit of the thinking back then and um, you know, any thoughts that spring to mind in terms of you know, the, the, the decision to, t to sort of give back the, the, uh, the reason that, um, mm. that the foundation subsequently chose to focus on education? Just talk about that side of things a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's again, you know, sometimes you make decisions and then years later they look like a really smart decision, but at the time it's a hallway conversation that you had. And I don't know what sparked it, but Mike and I said, well, if we're we're successful. Let's you know give back in in some way, and and we've both benefited. You know, in hindsight, again, it was a whole conversation. I think back then, but we've both benefited from a, you know, first class society, education system. Um, a lot of things have gone our way to end up where we are, and so we should give back in some way. And the way we did it is we sort of promised that if we you know we give one percent of our um, profits, one percent of our products, right? We give our products away free to non profits. In fact, we've done that before we even really pledged anything. Uh, we give 1% of our equity, uh, if it was ever worth anything, and employee time, 1% of our employee time. And it works out too, when you're a startup, like you don't have any profits. <laughs> you couldn't really give your product away for free. Like, you have anyone use it, so like, that, that's fantastic. Your equity is worth nothing, and you have no employees to, you know, like, that, that can give their time away. So it was sort of a promise that in the future, maybe something would be, would be worthwhile. And uh, for some reason, I think we just we told people about it. We told employees, we put it on our website, um, didn't really think much about it because again it was worth nothing at the time and then eventually it became worth something and uh, and we had employees who were interested in it um, and we started sort of led the charge in um, you know giving some money away and, and, and supporting people's uh, different uh, energies you know employees have different things they want to give away and then at some stage we had to decide well what what do we want the foundation to stand for because it's very easy to be diffuse you know like okay let's do you know, soup kitchens, and there must be cancer over here, and let's do education, you know, where there's a thousand things you can give to. And if you do it, you don't sort of get that feeling of achievement, you know, you just sort of feel like you've, um, whatever analogy is when you're throwing something small into something big and you don't see it. Anyway, like, uh, um, anyway, so, y y you, uh, so we decided that we were young enough and perhaps naive enough that we wanted to sort of fix some root cause issue as opposed to paper over something. And, uh, you know, a, a bad example, I guess, but you know, soup kitchens, for example, you know, are, they're amazing and they pr provide a really, you know, important service. But next day, there's, you know, people who still need to be fed. Whereas you think, okay, can you fix homeless in some way? It's, a, it's just a different mentality. And so we looked at, okay, what are the big root cause issues and what are the best ways to solve it? And it turns out that uh, education, uh, particularly of women, and particularly in the developing world, have the best ROI of almost any investment you can make uh, in nonprofit. And even people in other areas of nonprofit will tell you that's the case, even if they have a different passion, but that's, that's wide, uh, widely agreed upon. Um, and so we also came across a, a charity um, uh, called Room to Read, and their motto is that world change starts with educated children. And a guy named John Wood left Microsoft, and uh, he wrote a book called Leaving Microsoft to Change the World, and it talked about how effectively they developed uh, and gave give books away in the developing countries. It used to be that he tells this uh, story about going to Nepal and they had one book under lock and key and it was really important. And uh, he's like, well, what is it? It must be some pretty impressive book. And it was a Daniel Steele novel, like paperback, that some backpacker had left there. Um, <laughs> and they, don't even they didn't read English, so it didn't, you know, it was just sort of, uh, and so, you know, it was getting local language novels, you know, because if you're, a kid in uh, Nepal and you can't read, you know, learning to read English when you don't speak English is really difficult, so you want to, you know, like r read books in your local language. They then went and built libraries, and for about 20,000 US dollars, you can build a library uh, that will, you know, last for 50 or 100 years, and uh, they stock it with books and they work with the local uh, teachers, so they built hundreds of libraries around the world. And so that really appealed to us because it, you know, it's education for women in the developing world. Um, and that's of women programs in addition to the broad stuff that they do. And so uh, it was a few years ago now, uh, but we worked our way out from, um, actually, <laughs> it's a funny story. We, we called them up, I think, the first time we wanted to do something. And uh, it's a little bit of a long story, but uh, no, it's, it's a good story. We, uh, 
how do you know what story I'm going to tell? <laughs> I'm sure it will be a good story. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, <laughs> we had a business problem we needed to solve. And the business problem was that uh, we had, our, you know, the, the cheapest version of our product cost about $1,200. And when we looked at, you know, there was a $1,200 version, a $2,400, and a $4,800 version, so it sort of just doubled each time. And we looked at what people bought at different sizes. If you're a 10-person company, you still bought the $4,800 version. If you're a 100-person company, you bought the $4,800 version. And we're like, oh, we've got this pricing textbook, and it says you should price differentiate and have a curve. And so, okay, well, this curve's not working particularly well for us. Uh, and so we said, well, how would we be disruptive in this? And we decided we wanted to give um, some money, you know, basically make it a lot cheaper at the low end uh, for small companies. And we weren't sure how to do that. Um, and then we read a different little textbook that says you should experiment your way to everything. So, okay, let's do that. How do you experiment with price changes? Okay, this is difficult. Uh, so we came up with an idea that instead of $1,200, we would make a five-user version of our products available for $5, and we'd run it for five days. So effectively, we turn it into five, you know, five users for $5 for five days only. Like it's a, it's a one-time sale, come and get it. And we had internal polls, and we give the money away to charity. It's kind of like the nice, you know, nice uh, PR angle. I think we were just thinking about like how do we get news and make make bigger, bigger deal about it. And uh, internally, we had a poll on you know how much money we'd raise, and the the highest number was twenty five thousand dollars. And in five days, we raised a hundred, a little over a hundred thousand US dollars, which is pretty impressive in five dollar increments. Like that's a, that's a lot of people who've uh, who've signed up. And uh, then we called up Brenda Reed and said, hey, well. You know that thing we talked about last week about raising money? Well, here's a hundred thousand dollar check. I'm like, who 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 are you? Like <laughs> <laughs> Australia. Hang on, let me get a map. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so, you know, then we gave money to, and then we became a big partner and a few years later we were then number one corporate uh, corporate partner actually. It was uh, us, then Goldman Sachs, then Barclays Bank. Which uh, <laughs> which just felt good because we were about, you know, three hundred people at the time. So to sort of edge out these global companies in terms of giving felt really good. Um, and so since then, we've, we've been a, a big uh, supporter of them. Uh, we've now branched out to do other um, organizations in similar space. Uh, there's one called 40K that does a lot of, um, helps children learn English through d um, deployment of tablets in the developing world um, that has, again, really a scalable you know, ROI. You know, as we all know, when you bring technology uh, into play, you can do things a lot cheaper than you could you know, manually. So we're doing really well there. And the last one we're doing, is, uh, which uh, Mark's wearing the T-shirt, is Pledge 1%. So we had, well done, well done, <laughs> and spin. Um, we had, uh, uh, the idea is we had uh, such a good response from what we'd done, like, you know, pledging 1%. And we found some other companies doing there, like Salesforce had done some stuff uh, around that. They're probably the most well-known for it. But it just wasn't, we were, looked not, we were the only ones doing it. And, it, you know, we had a great benefit giving back. But then when I chatted with our employees from a purely selfish business one, if you want to convince your, your boss, like our... Um, our culture at Atlassian and the fact that we give back were two of the top three reasons people chose to work for us. And so the even the hard edge version is like, well, more companies should be doing this because it's great for employee attraction, particularly amongst Gen, uh, what are we, Gen Y and then mill millennials, I think, right? Um, mm. uh, the younger people, <laughs> <laughs> younger than me. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, so we, yeah, we, we started Pledge 1% with the idea that we wanted to change the way corporate philanthropy gets done. And we're up to 6,000, is it, I think? 6,500 like members now. It's been going yeah. about four years. And uh, 6,500 members and about 650 in Australia. Yeah, <coughs> so we, we punch above weight in Australia. And there's 6,500 companies that have individually pledged to give 1% of their you know, product, profit, equity, or employee time. There will be some people in the room tonight who are also members of Pledge 1%. Yeah. In fact, can I just ask you to stand up if you happen to be a member of Pledge 1%? Only a small number, but thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> <coughs> um, so, that, yeah, so that was our, our journey on um, philanthropy. We now, um, one of my life goals was to help, uh, you know, a certain number of people in, in the world, and we've helped a quarter of a million peop uh, children in Cambodia to get an education who otherwise wouldn't have. So I feel pretty proud about that when you sort of, you know, oh, it sounds like around that, and you're like, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of kids who, uh, exactly. who and again, not from us, it's from our customers and from everyone else who, who helps. Awesome. Okay, um, I think I will throw it open to the floor. So we've got um, Rob in this aisle, we've got Steve in this aisle. Um, if you want to ask a question, please put up your hand. Uh, if you're given the mic, please stand up um, and then go for it. We'll so I'll sort of signal who to, but there you go, up the back, that'd be great. Um, 
Hi, Scott. So you mentioned that it was the culture that made people actually want to work for you. When you keep growing 50%, 100% year on year, how do you make sure that the culture is retained um, as you grow bigger and bigger and you don't let it become one of those example companies that you gave at the very beginning? Mm. And what's your name and where are you from? Um, my name is Ash and I'm from Accenture Interactive. Yeah, okay, thanks Ash. Uh, look, it's really hard. Culture is the most important thing in my mind. Um, if you go Peter Drucker, who's probably most renowned as the management guru, says culture eats strategy for breakfast, uh, which I think is, is very true. And culture is a bit like, um, if you look at a company's brand, uh, you know, a brand is not what you put on a t-shirt, it's not the billboard you have, it's like the sum total of what the rest of the world thinks about your company. And that's, uh, you know, every employee interaction, everything you do as a company ends up as your brand. And culture is similar, right? Culture is every single thing you do internally from what you recognize to uh, what you um, tell people is not okay, uh, you know, to the, the rituals you have, the types of people you hire. Um, and so we were quite lucky. Um, the story uh, for us is about when some certain thresholds when you hit employees, like one is 50, one's 100, um, it's about 400, 800, 1600. Anyway, so there's certain thresholds where you've got to change the way you operate. And at about 50 employees, my experience and many others is that uh, you can't interview them all yourself. You know, after about 50, you sort of know everyone in the company, you know their name. If you've got a bad culture and you're a small company, you can't really blame anyone else. Like, it's, you know, oh, everyone here is horrible. I hate working with them. Well, you hide them all. So, um, but above 50, you, you have to institutionalize the stuff that you do personally. And we made some hiring mistakes between 50 and 100. And uh, just, not that they were bad people, but just they didn't fit. And we're like, why does it not fit as well? And, uh, and so then we had to go and discover our culture and document it. And I think because we'd had that experience then, we were probably early in documenting our culture and writing it down and making sure it was part of our practices compared to most companies and maybe much larger uh, when they do that. Um, and so we're asking, we have a very distinct culture. It's probably, it's very collaborative. Um, People tell me there's very little politics at Atlassian. Um, that, you know, again, collaborative is good and bad. If you're too collaborative, you need to make decisions. If you're not collaborative enough, people get upset. So um, you know, we're on the more collaborative uh, side of things. I do think every company's culture, there's no such thing as a good or a bad culture. There's, you know, a strong and a weak culture. Uh, I argue that Goldman Sachs is actually a very strong culture. If you go there, they have a very strong culture of what they do. And if you go to the Red Cross, they're a very strong culture of what they do. Both strong cultures, but you wouldn't say they're the same, what, you know, but you wouldn't say one's better or worse, just fit for what they want to do. Um, and so every day we think about what we do at Alaskan. Um, the big ones are hiring. So we have a cultural interview in, in the hiring process where someone is just looking, did this person fit? Um, it's harder to scale that um, and make sure you end up with diversity. It's actually you need to do that um, very specifically so the culture interview doesn't end up with a do you look like me, sound like me um, uh, aspect. Um, anyway, so we think about it a lot. We have traditions around it. Uh, it's the culture of a two and a half thousand person. I tell me, distinguish values and culture are different. Values is what you hold true. And I don't think as a company that should ever really change. Culture is how work gets done. Like, you know, does culture of a 10 person startup is I walk to your desk and I say, do this and you do it. And then I turn around and it's done. Like that's, a, that's culture at a startup. You know, culture at a multi thousand person company is I want to get this on your quarterly goals for next quarter. Uh, you know, so work gets done in a different way. Uh, and that changes as you grow and scale, but your value, values should never change. And so I really want to have the best culture for every size you know, we're at. We're about 2,500 employees, so we're maybe a bit more than that now. Um, you know, and so I want to have the best culture for a 2,500 person organization, but you can't really compare it to a 10 person or you know, a 100,000 person company. Thanks, Ash. Thank you. Somebody over on this side. <coughs> There you go, Steve. Hi, Scott. I'm Eric Hi. from Venture Builders. Uh, Atlassian might be the most famous bootstrap in Australian history. I was just wondering if you started Atlassian or you had another great idea today, would you still consider bootstrapping or would you use the developing an ecosystem and raise capital? Thanks, Eric. Good question. Uh, Firstly, I don't think our bootstrapping was some deliberate ploy on our behalf back then. There was just no money. This is 2001. The dot-com crash had just happened. 
uh, you know, we were two 22-year-olds coming out from college to build a better bug tracker, um, you know, like that with no business experience and no one would have given us money. If even probably today, no one would give us money. And uh, so we had no, had no choice. Uh, we were lucky that you, uh, if you look at a lot of companies that are, are reasonably large now, like Dropbox being another one that started around that time, because it was a sort of a, a dearth of, um, of money and like, you know, technology was dead, uh, it was actually a long time, like we could sort of build and spend a lot of time growing before you had a lot of competition because there was just not many other people out there building companies in that dot-com crash. And so, you know, the best, best time to start a company is in a downturn. Uh, you know, when it's booming, is actually a very difficult time. You get to compete for talent and money and everything else. Uh, so best time is in a downturn. We did that. Um, if I go these days, uh, these days almost all companies are global from day one. Your competitors are not, you know, the shop down the corner or who's doing stuff, you know, in, in Melbourne. The competitors is someone in Dubai or someone in Dublin uh, you know, like, or someone in Durban, like building, you know, something. And uh, that's, if you're global from day one, then you've got a competitive set day one. So the prize becomes bigger. The prize is everyone in the world uses my product. When you have big prizes, you attract more competitors. And, you know, if more competitors, well, then you've got, you know, a, a bigger race. And so in a bigger race, you say, well, do I want to be more funded or less funded than my competitors? I, you know, even if I'm really smart, they're really smart, but they've got, you know, more, we have a, more people. Uh, and an example of this, my um, co-founder did a, a sort of a startup in, uh, during university. It was called Bookmark Box. And uh, back in the day before you really, basically it was before Google, the way you'd find stuff is you'd bookmark it because you'd never find it again if you, you know, you, you, you lost it. And so, uh, but you often, you know, people didn't have their own computers. They'd go use ones at work and ones at home. And so this would store your bookmarks in the cloud. A weird, weird thing. I guess it was a precursor to delicious if anyone remembers that like um which then became i guess i don't know twitter or yelp or, or reddit or what, i mean like it's um, it sort of idea comes around um but they they sold to the biggest competitor they'd raised two hundred thousand dollars in friends and family their competitor raised 20 million dollars and you when your competitor raises a hundred times more money you like it's like time to sell <laughs> uh because you, know, you just can't compete no matter how inept they are they've got a hundred times more people building something so if i was starting something today um, I would advocate for people to take uh, venture capital for most, you know, if you want to be a large global business, um, I would advocate for doing that. Um, and it's a different, it's a different uh, beast to do that. Okay. <coughs> Hi, Scott. Hi. Um, thanks for sharing earlier. It was um, really good and nice to meet you. Um, nice to meet you. I'm Scott. <laughs> <laughs> My name's not Scott. <laughs> Sorry, what is your name? I'm just about to say. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to be polite first and sort of say a few nice things. My name's David Tarr. I'm the founder of Maturius. Um, we're the money ball of talent matching technology for underutilized and undervalued workers. Ah. And our niche is mature age. So my question is, if we can go back a while, back, back, to when your credit cards were maxed out, and you're thinking, oh my God, is this ever going to happen? And then take you to today, and with the benefit of hindsight, is there anything you would do new, better, and different back in that early period mm. as advice? That's a good question. I'll, I'll tell you a few different ways. Um, one is that it's hard to know if you're onto something successful often in the heat of the moment. You're like, well, am I, is this going to work or not? And we were pretty lucky that we were reasonably successful. Like we tried a few different things, but when we built Jira, it ended up being quite successful quite quickly. I remember our, our revenue were maybe 100 grand, 300 grand, 1.2 million, 4 million, 12 million, 21, 35, 44 in the global financial crisis of 2008, 55, and I think we went to 89 the next year. So, like, we set a pretty accelerated, like, run off nothing. And I advise a lot of startups um, and uh, some, so some close friends. And some of the best advice I've given is to people who are amazing people trapped in a shitty business. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, amazing talent out there that, like, is not doing the, you know, the best work of their lives because whatever they do is not being used by enough people to make a difference. 
And some of the best advice I gave him was, hey, I've seen success. <laughs> you can build a really slow, grinded out business or try something different. Um, and that business is now, they changed it around. It's, I think it raised money about $400 million uh, most recent round. Like, and it was purely that they took the bet to sort of say, well, this is this okay business, we're going to try something, something different. And so it's very hard to know very early on is the thing going to be successful. If, it, um, if, if people think it's going to be successful, you aren't trying anything new or innovative. Like if everyone believes that, oh, that's a great, it's a no-brainer. Well, then someone's already building it. Uh, and so um, when I think somewhat tangential, but like I view that every new business really needs some sort of wave, like something needs to change in the market place uh, for your new business to be successful. Because if the world hasn't changed, then someone's already doing what you're about to do. Like, so there's got to be something that's different, uh, whether it's mobile deployment that happened. Um, you know, uh, for us, it was, you know, the internet came around and we could sell online, we could uh, use open source software, we could build browser-based software. So a lot of things lined up for us. Um, but I think a, a startup needs to exist in a world where there's some sort of change in the environment. If you can't name what that change is, well, there should be a good reason why you e exist. It's hard to, hard to know that. So if we go back into the, the credit card side, um, you know, we, I guess we, it's very easy to start a business when you're 22 because, you know, 300 bucks, I think we paid ourselves $300 a week for two years. Um, and, you know, between that and doing some university uh, mentoring and stuff like that, uh, I could, you know, live on that. Um, and so well, if all, all else failed, I'd just go home and live on my parents' couch again. So the downside risk is not, you know, not that much. I really admire people that sort of say, right, I'm going to save tens of thousands of dollars, put my house at, on the line to go to a startup. I think that's a, those people need to be lauded, um, you know, and the risks that they take. Um, and so I, I can't think of it at the time back then to say whether it was a worth or not, like um, how did I feel? It was more, well, if it doesn't work, I have to go work for PwC, you know, and uh, put a suit back on. Um, it's okay, like I'll make this work, you know, go as long as we can. Uh, without, you know, this is why we didn't take a, a big salary for many years, um, because we wanted to make sure we had that, that cushion. Um, so maybe I've answered perfectly, but hopefully that's useful. Uh, hi, Scott. Hi. Uh, Paul from uh, Sydney Machine Learning. Um, so this question's a bit left field to the rest of the startup questions tonight. Yep. But um, my question for you is, Atlassian must be collecting a lot of data at the moment. Uh -huh. um, and my question is, it, does Atlassian have a machine learning strategy for the near term and the long term? And if so, uh, what, what is that? And if you might be able to elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, I'll go through that quickly. I'm not sure it's a broadly applicable question. But uh, um, the look, um, if you look through um, in history, like where do businesses get created? You generally create uh, a sustainable business because you had um, a monopoly on some sort of, not the wrong word, but like you were good at attracting some sort of supply. Like, and so for us, it was that we could attract the software developers really well because we were software developers ourselves. We could attract them. People wanted to work for us versus work at a bank. And so we could attract a large number of software developers to solve a problem. Uh, a few years later, designers were in high demand, right? Because it wasn't just functional software people wanted. They wanted so software that they could use. And you end up with the, the Airbnbs and, you know, those types of, uh, of companies where they sort of, they won because of a loss on design. And if you look forward as, you know, again, it's easier now to build stuff than ever before. Like people, you know, it's with AWS, it's not because you need capital to go build out data centers. Uh, designers, there's a lot more design patterns you can copy. So if all these initial advantages disappear as you then, you know, they become more commodities for everyone. Um, so then the next one I think at the moment is data. And you say, well, if I have more data than my competitors, can I build a better experience for my customers than my competitors? And that's one of those ones where the, the more customers you have, the more data you get, therefore if you can make your service better, then the more customers you have. And um, yeah, that's why you know, many uh, large internet companies, you look at you say, the Googles and so forth uh, of the world, have more data, so therefore they can make a better experience. Um, it's an interesting, completely aside, it's an interesting question for things like antitrust because uh, you know, the big get bigger and they'll be harder to topple, but actually the consumer's using them for free. <laughs> so, you know, how do you, how do you reconcile that? Um, back to Atlassian, we, we collect a lot of data, uh, you know, on our customers in order to make, you know, their lives easier. Like, uh, for example, a really simple example is in a service desk. Uh, you might use, you know, a word that is not particularly common. You know, you say, hey, my computer's broken. 
but the service desk person skewed, you know, keyed that as laptop instead of computer, and we match those words automatically just by the number of people that you know, start using the system. So we do do that. I think we're still early in the journey of collecting and using data in our, uh, in our customer system, so that's, uh, we made pretty large investments over the last couple of years in improving that. Thank Thanks. you very much. <coughs> Down here. Hi, Scott. I'm Jim. Hi, Jim. Um, you didn't mention what your father's career was, mm. um, but obviously he got hold of some Wang computers somewhere. <laughs> I'll ask a classic for you. I don't know if you have children, but if you do, or if you will, what would you recommend for them to study to keep up with the world? Because, I mean, I'm working in blockchain now, and 10 years ago, you know, nobody ever heard of it. Hmm. What would you recommend for your children to study hmm. to keep up with the career? That's a great question, Jim. Uh, so there's a few things um, that I think about. So I've got three young children, um, uh, three, five, and seven, boy, boy, and boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you have kids and a wife, you'll understand uh, <laughs> that deeply. Uh, so I think about what, what, what do I want my kids to, to walk a away with and in, in life. And for me, it's a love of learning because I think that that is more important than ever before. It used to be that you said, right, I learned for the first 20 years of my life, you know, or maybe in 15 if you didn't go to you know, university, great, then I go work for a period of time and they're very separate tasks. Whereas these days we all know everything we learned at university is irrelevant, mine was irrelevant I think when I was doing it, but like most, you know, <laughs> maybe it's irrelevant a few years later. Uh, so the love of learning is really important. So this is my list, everyone has their own one. Um, need to learn. Two, I think the ability to process and understand and discern information is increasingly important for children, like for people in this world, because it used to be like I trusted institutions, I, I trust the news, I trust what like. And these days, I look at my, um, you know, my parents or my parents-in-law, and you know, whether it's conspiracy theories or just discernment of information is something that they didn't grow up with, and so that's that's really difficult. I think, um, you know, so I want my kids to really understand uh, information. I think they need a strong self sense of self and understanding themselves, which I think that most people don't uh, necessarily do that and sort of having a, a strong self-worth, um, especially, again, as the breakdown of traditional, ins traditional institutions like church or community groups or other ones splinter and to be more an indiv individualist society. So I think sense of self is important. And in that, I, I would um, classify your, um, how you learn yourself, like your mode of learning, because many people don't know that. You know, do I learn by reading, by talking to people, by doing stuff? Like, what is that? And we should teach that. We should all test everyone when they're 10 and find out, like, what it is. Um, most people don't find it till later. Um, so there's, tho there's those things. Um, I think the ability to interact with people, uh, it, it becomes increasingly important. Um, so they're the sort of soft skills, but actually I think they're probably more important than any hard skills because you can kind of learn the hard skills and they'll probably change. Um, I do think that understanding algorithms, uh, whether it's computers or coding or you can do philosophy, you know, and understand kind of, you know, logic. Um, but I think you need to understand that because uh, uh, increasingly the world is around algorithms and, you know, automation and stuff like that. If you don't understand how that works, uh, you know, it's, it's like people that, you know, go to the air conditioner, I want to be colder, and they're like, crank the air conditioning dial down, and you're like, well, it's not going to get any colder. But they just don't understand the mental model of how an air conditioning works. Like more and more of our lives are going to have machines, and if you don't sort of map the mental model of how that works or how the internet works, like you're going to struggle. So I think some sort of computational thing is important uh, to learn. Um, and then if you think about the jobs from they're going to be automated or not automated, um, in my mind, if you can do a job by yourself today, it's likely to be automated. If you can do a job by yourself, like sitting by yourself and do the job, it's likely to be automated. It's teamwork and, and effectively different disciplines coming together that's actually the things that are going to be less automated, less susceptible to automation. Um, and, you know, just to show, start, like, I think, um, you know, surgery will be automated. Uh, you know, like, surgery will be automated before gardening is, like, it'd be an interesting one, like, uh, because the money at risk and, you know, so forth is makes it worthwhile automating, uh, you know, your heart bypass or something like that because machines can do thousands of them and they can learn from every single machine in the world whereas your heart surgeon might do one a day. Uh, you know, so those things will be automated quickly but when you have to bring a team of people together to, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, a researcher with, um, 
a designer, like you know, to create stuff. That's that's where I think it's going to be hard to automate. Um, so that's the philosophy I have for for kids. Language is an interesting one. Um, people say that you understand the world. Once you know two languages, you can understand the world because you only understand one language and then you can really kind of think um, introspectively and kind of really um, just think in a different way. Uh, my kids are learning two languages just because my, um, my grandmother lives, well, my wife's mother lives with us and, uh, and she speaks German, so they get to do that. So it hasn't really been a choice for us. It's interesting because... Uh, in the future, you know, we will have babble, babble fish. We will have something in our ear that just translates as we talk. So is it really important to learn that? Um, I do think it's, um, if you look at the studies, you know, most people that spend hundreds of hours, thousands of hours learning a secondary language in high school, they can't remember it two years after they graduate. Yeah, and yeah. so you've really got to, you know, strongly believe that that, you know, with a different thought process that they got from learning, you know, a couple of dozen words in French and doing them badly, like, Versus, could those could that time be spent, you know, on better things, you know, in education? And so, um, I think it's an interesting question we should ask ourselves. Yeah, if you're going to be fluent in it, and you're going to learn it, and you're going to learn it at home and do it like that's great. But compulsory languages at school, where you learn it just a little bit, if it doesn't result in actually you thinking in that language, I feel like it's a bit of a waste of time. Uh, hi, Scott. My name is Keegan. I uh, I work with first-time leaders, so I'm maybe a bit of an anomaly here. I'm more interested in the people side mm. but picking up on what you just talked about I'm interested in why teams so I was at your team tour earlier this year and you sort of said the, the speed that information moves across an organisation is your competitive mm. advantage and are you playing in the team space by design or by default um, look I think if you look at some people some entrepreneurs um, and there's I say Jeff Bezos, if you look back, his business plan for Amazon, you know, he wrote, again, after going to consulting and, you know, working investment banking and in his mid-30s, but he wrote a pretty accurate summation of uh, what he wanted to build in Amazon, which I hats off to. We were like 22. <laughs> we just graduated from university. We kind of didn't want to get a real job. So, like, our master plan for our company isn't quite, wasn't quite as well thought out back then. <laughs> Uh, and so I don't think we sort of say, yeah, teams, okay, yeah, individuals, not cross teams, yeah, done, done. Like, um, so what we did is we built products that helped teams collaborate and uh, we got pretty good at it and we said, okay, well, let's do more of that. It, it seems to have a big impact. And uh, uh, Archimedes or Aristotle, depending on which Wikipedia page you read, uh, you know, said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum upon which to uh, move it and I can move the world, right? And so the idea is you get a lever long enough, you can make any change. And so we have about 130,000 companies use our products. And if we make them 50%, each of them 50% more effective, like that is research institutes, you know, is curing cancer, it is people putting, you know, people in space, it is, you know, every single industry we're a big part of. And I think, well, what could I personally do that has as much an impact as, as that? Um, and then, you know, we, we look at what um, way we can help. Um, individual productivity, like it's one thing, but if you look at... Um, how teams work together. So if you go back from an anthropological um, sense, uh, effectively us and you know, a lot of other species uh, out there, um, uh, uh, take the Neanderthals for example, there's a belief that you know, out we developed language and we could communicate with each other. And with language you effectively go from an individual you know, shared knowledge to a collective shared knowledge. And then eventually you get to written words and you can pass it down, or well you pass it down through the ages you know, from story told by the campfire and then eventually you get written word and you can you know share that far and wide um, and so if you look at anthropological the reason we're all here is effectively we worked out to communicate and work as teams that's the only reason that we like are all sitting here and not you know kind of in a in a tree eating you know fruit like um and so you know how do you make that possible and if you look at most people's work days a lot of people's time is not creatively solving problems it's shuffling work around your organization well i heard from this let me get together and tell my team this and then you go around and tell like and how do we make that more effective? Um, and so, you know, with our products, we try and make that a lot more effective in terms of getting information around there to different people. And I think that will always be a problem uh, that could be improved on. And uh, uh, Jeff Bezos also says something smart, which is too many, too many businesses and people focus on what's going to change in the next two years. Uh, and he says he wants to focus on what's not going to change in the next 10 years. I was like, okay, that's a good thing. Well, it's always going to be hard to, you know, communicate and collaborate with people. So we focus on, on that problem. Um, and until we get brain-to-brain -brain communication, telepathy, 
um, I think we're pretty safe that that'll be a problem. Can we have the mic down the front for our colleague from, UNF from UNSW? <laughs> oh, thank you, my friend. Um, I'm very Can I ask, ask you to stand you, up? You sorry. So Can I just ask you to stand up? Oh, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> my name is George Stone. Hey, George. I'm an architect. Uh, but, but I'm very interested in what you have to say because um, I wanted to ask you about uh, did you have any experience with your parents when they said, oh, you look... Scott, you look exactly like your dad did when he went behind the toilet to have a smoke as a young man. Yeah. And what that is, that's the DNA which is being passed. It's a memory yep. from a distant era yep. that's been passed down to you, mm -hmm. right? And so it, it's incredibly important that we realise that, that when we're alive and, and young people, we are actually carrying around memories with us. Yep. And that's and, and, and you have so much stuff in your head. I was wondering whether uh, there's some way you could translate my very, very basic sort of ordinary look at it and, and see what can we do with this memory that comes from us from a past era, the DNA. Yeah, I think, does, does, I I think that, that might be a beer question for you. I was going to say, I'll hypothesise that that's the, that's, that that's the first time you've been asked that question. That is the first time you've asked that question. Let me grab you for a beer later and we can chat about that <laughs> <laughs> in detail. Yeah. I gave up drinking and smoking. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could, could be water then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. We've got somebody with their hand <laughs> up down here. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, you guys got Mark Lambert. Uh, I'm the founder of a new startup, uh, Seeker. And I guess, as you mentioned before, basically, you know, the, the world's becoming a new global marketplace and we've got yep. this new uh, strain, I suppose, with capital and um, pe people resources. Um, but there's certainly still some major hubs in the world. Yep. Um, if you were to start again, how would you sort of decide where to be setting yourself up and where you'd be looking for those sort of funds? Yeah, that's a good question. I think if you'd asked me that... Five or six years ago, I would say Silicon Valley is the place to, to, to be um, because it is the epicenter of you know, capital and, you know, and software development. These days, I do know and we have about 1,000 people in Silicon Valley, give or take, and, uh, and it's really difficult to find and keep talent there because you know, everyone wants it. Um, capital these days is sort of a global concern. You know, maybe it's 10% more efficient market over there than here, but it's not enough that you'd you know, upend your family and your connections and so forth to raise money to 10% higher premium, you know, to go overseas. Uh, and so I think it's really, um, generally businesses can start from anywhere. Um, what, you know, at the, at the starting phase, you just got to have product market fit. So finding the founding team where you can find, you know, 10 or 20 people that can really get to a stage where, wow, build something. Um, again, assuming just normal internet startup stuff, we're not doing hardcore tech here. Uh, you need a startup team that can get to a certain stage. And once you've got that, you then need to find uh, senior people that have done it before to help scale the business because the steps you're doing is really unique. The scaling part, actually, um, I was probably pretty naive to think that we had a unique experience. No, it's actually everyone has the same you know, bumps along that road. Um, that's the bit that's harder to find in Australia. Um, that's the reason we import a lot of talent um, in Atlassian, not because we want to. It's really expensive and takes a long time to find. Uh, but it's just the, the scaling part there's less companies that have ever done it before in Australia. So that's the hard part. When you start doing that, you go, okay, well, maybe I want to put a sales team in the US, probably not in Silicon Valley, but I can go find it in uh, Austin, Texas, or I can go find it in Rayleigh. You know, um, so it's a lot, you know, there's a lot of ways to scale it. But in terms of starting, if you're looking at a global, at something global, I've, I've seen that happen from everywhere. You know, we've got some great examples. Canva you know, is a great example. They're doing some amazing things. They're located in Surrey Hills. Um, I can go through a whole list, but... I don't think that's a barrier anymore. And to be honest, if you have got that founding team here, if you just sort of up by yourself and said, I'm going to go to Silicon Valley and find 10 people and do a startup, and there's a lot of competition for, you know, for, for that over there, um, and it's, it's, it's quite difficult to differentiate yourself. Down the front here, please. <coughs> Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Hi, Scott. Okay. I'm Jack from Galactic Moves, so where a house moving startup. And before I ask my question, can I have lunch with you? <laughs> like, <laughs> no, no, no pressure. <laughs> like, that, that, was, that was your question? <laughs> oh, no, no, that, that, that was just, you know. Hey, op you mind. get one question. Yeah. <laughs> Use it wisely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll get to the question. <laughs> so the question is, uh, 
um, a lot of us aspire to be like you, to be like, you know, very successful. And what do you actually miss about when you had nothing? Like when, when no one knew you and you had nothing and like you could do whatever you want. Like, do you miss anything? Uh, thanks, Thank that you. is interesting. I haven't have been asked that question before. Um, well, firstly, I have a, a mentor of mine who, who said uh, like a year or two ago, he, he said, these are the good old days. And I said, oh, God, what do you mean? So, well, like in five years' time, you'll look back at today and think it's the good old days. And it's true at every stage of life that today is like the good old days that you're going to go and reminisce about in a couple of years' time. And so it was kind of instruct instructive to me to say, well, don't look forward, you know, of like, look, it's going to be so much better in the future. Uh, you know, look at today and go, well, today, like, how do I make this the, the good old days that you go forward? And so I don't really ever look back and say things are better or worse back then. You know, I've been incredibly lucky. Um, you know, there's plenty of smarter, more you know, smarter, more attractive, better connected, like, people than, than I am, you know, and, like, I've ended up having a great outcome. Um, and so incredibly lucky there. Uh, but, you know, you look back, I, you know, the people I worked with when you're small and start up, where you're a camaraderie, you know, camaraderie, um, you know, I've got three young kids, it's a fantastic family, I'm not out there, you know, drinking beers with my mates on a Friday night, like, after we've spent all day coding and before we're going to, you know, spend the next day coding. So I'd, I think at every stage of life, um, you've got to really enjoy the stage you're at. Uh, I talked to my, years and years ago, I uh, had a conversation with my, with my wife, uh, actually, and um, we hadn't moved in together and she wanted to move in, but she was living with a family, it was, you know, like, she'd have to give up her family to move in with us. And uh, I said, well, let's never rush in life to go to the next phase of life. You know, like, because a natural conclusion, if you rush too fast through life, you don't want to end up at that destination. Like, so enjoy the moment you've got right now versus trying to think what would be like in the future or, or, or what would that be. Yeah. Jack? Over this side. <coughs> Just down the front here. Thanks, Bob. Back here all day, I'm detained this on the other monitor. You said that you spent six months developing the product and the next six months trying to get the first customer. Yep. Can you describe, because you are an expert in making a product, the, the, the phase between month six and month 12 till you got your first customer, and what was the full cycle? Yeah, so w once you've, my experience is that uh, no matter how good your first, you know, you need a first customer, and it doesn't matter how, you know, good your first product is, you usually know someone who knows someone to get you that first customer. And we had some customers that would take a bet on us, and. Um, you know, we might have met them at a trade show or they're a friend of a friend. And so I think the first couple of customers, it was really just elbow grease of, you know, meeting people online. Um, you know, anyone that came to a website and signed up, we'd spend, you know, days writing emails to them and crafting, you know, witty things to say so they'd reply to them. Um, so uh, you, you had nothing else to do, right? You wrote your own code and you answered stuff from customers. Um, we did some funny things early on um, when we were, uh, we sponsored a conference and by sponsoring a conference, like I don't think we'd ever done it before, by sponsoring a conference, we turned up with a, a trestle table that folded out and uh, we went to Kinko's and, and printed a little poster. Like, and by a poster, like it was, it was like that big. <laughs> and hung it up behind our desk on the wall that was like back behind our desk and had some business cards on the table and like a laptop to show our product. And Everyone had these professional boots and, you know, and like that was us. We didn't know any different. And uh, um, at that conference, though, we, um, uh, there used to be a, it was called Java Posse, but basically a, a podcast. And the podcast would do a live broadcast from this conference. And it was at a, in a cinema. So it was this huge sort of amphitheater cinema. I think more conferences should be in cinemas because everyone can see, like, great sound quality. And uh, we um, went to the local beer shop and we bought know, 20 cases of beer, and we stuck Atlassian labels on every single one of them, <laughs> and uh, then we handed the beer out as people walked into this conference. Now, we hadn't asked permission to do that, like, <laughs> no one questioned us, um, and uh, so we, basically every person at this entire conference, for basically the cost of, I don't know, $2 for each beer, was sitting there drinking a beer with our logo on it. And then the people doing the, you know, the conference were sitting there and they'd be like, hey, can I get another one of those Alaskan beers? And <laughs> so like everyone listening at home knew that we were like the, the beer sponsor of this thing. Um, and so 
I think there's an element of like you could never do, as a big company you would get like a hand slap for doing that uh, these days, and there's sort of a, a chutz par that you can get away with when you when you're small. Um, I remember once I sent our HR, she was an intern I think, to UNSW and said, hey, can you put some job ads up on the on the jobs board uh, there? And uh, she printed, I didn't know this till later, but like she basically printed an entire, you know like those A4 boxes of like, <laughs> she printed the whole thing and then she went and stuck it everywhere <laughs> on campus. Like, and not like on the job board, she went to every lift and stuck them like on every bit she could stick <laughs> on the lift. <laughs> before she left, before she, while she was still at the university, we got phone calls from the university saying, hey, um, can you come take down the, like 500, you know, jo job ads you'd put up, like for interns. And so, again, not, you know, probably wouldn't do it today, but like you can get away with that stuff when you when you when you're small. So, I think just that level gets you your first customer. Um, there's no magic, you know, it wasn't a magic Google AdWords campaign or anything like that. It was really the sort of hustle of, you know, we've got something that we believe in and we convince someone to take a bet on us. Up the back, Steve. Yep. So Steve's got the power. He controls the mic. You've got to look after Steve. Hi, Matt from the API practice. Um, I think like a lot of people in the room, we've been frustrated with both federal and state contribution to the tech startup scene. So it's really great to see you guys um, involved with the recent thing done in Everleaf. Um, what can we expect from Atlassian to keep the state honest? And also, what's Atlassian's take on the use of space which could otherwise be used for public amenities such as White Bay or Australian Technology Park. Um, and is there anything specifically you would want from governments, Matt? Um, greater contributions, um, more, more accessibility to funding and creation of um, both jobs and opportunity outside of and within the city, I think. Yeah. Yep. So uh, man, I, I, I take an interesting view on this, maybe different to many people which is I, um, I always look where the government should intervene, where there's a market failure, or where they need to encourage something different, right? Because if you go to every sector, they say, well, give me more money and I'll be better, uh, whether that's the mining sector or whether that's the tech sector. Like, you know, everyone wants uh, sort of more of the government money, which just means we need to raise more taxes to do, to do it all. So I always think with government, like, what, what is the, you know, the, the area that's, that's failing? And so if you go back a couple of years, the, the government did the um, uh, I mean ESV CLP, the Early Stage Ven Venture Capital Limited Partnerships, um, which is effectively an extra tax break uh, to invest in funds that invested in early stage companies. Um, and, you know, you could argue that some of those tax breaks are very generous, but if you look at the resulting, you know, we went from really no venture capital funds and now we have Airtree and Blackbird and Square Peg and there's a whole VC industry in Australia and a large part of that was kicked off initially with those, that tax deduction. Um, and so the federal government did that, and I think that's been wildly successful. I'm sure at some stage they'll, they'll taper it off or whatever once we've got to a critical mass. Um, so there's things like that that I think are, are very well done. The, uh, at a federal government, I think the, uh, uh, that, um, stage. anyway, effectively the export, uh, EMDG, the Export Market Development Grant, where basically if you spent money marketing overseas, the government would give you a tax break on that. And if you want to differentiate between a startup and a local corner store, you know, like startup, not that they're better or worse, but the startup has a potential to employ a large number of people and bring a lot of export dollars, whereas the corner store is more of a zero-sum game. Like if they're not doing it, someone else is going to have the corner store, right? But it's quite difficult from a policy perspective to differentiate between those two. Like they look, so some say they look the same. They employ two people. They, you know, and so um, giving you money to spend on marketing overseas is actually a very clear way to differentiate between a potential global startup. So. There's been some programs like that um, where I think the government has, ha has played a role. Um, the areas that I have personal passion around um, are immigration um, is, a, is a hot button issue, um, but uh, I think highly skilled migration is less of a contentious issue, but it gets sort of all wrapped up into the same, the same area. And so uh, we worked with the government to, to try and improve that. Um, but, you know, we want to bring you know, people that earn a very large amount of money, you know, in from overseas to pay taxes in Australia, train the next generation of Australians in technology um, for jobs that we literally just can't, there's no one in Australia that does it. Like, I feel like that is a, a reasonably easy thing to do, but it's quite, from political, it's quite, you've got to separate that out from, you know, mass migration where you're worried about people losing their jobs as a hairdresser or something. Um, 
kind of state level or we're spending a lot of time on the um, central to Everly uh, corridor because we want to create a um, call like basically a tech central. So we want to basically create an epicenter for technology in Sydney. And at the moment, if you're a, you know, you're a girl and you're 12 and you're saying, what careers do I want to go to? You can go to the Supreme Court and watch, you know, judges. You can go to a hospital and, and see that. You can go to, you know, you know schools very well, but you could, um, you know, you can go see the different careers available, but there's nowhere to go to see technology. Like, where do you go to sort of understand that? Um, and we want uh, Tech Central to be the place where, you know, technology is an epicenter um, to encourage people into the industry, um, but also, again, to encourage people from overseas to come here. Because one of the biggest reasons people don't come here is that if they don't like the company they're working at that, that brought them here, is there a job number two or number three in Australia? And that's the biggest thing we find is people at a senior level are like, oh, I love working for you, but if it didn't work out in a year's time, I have to move my whole family back because I don't... So if we get, you know, a Tech Central and we've got more people and more mass, that actually helps us to attract talent. So those are the things that I, I look at. Um, it's very easy to ask sort of for more handouts uh, you know, of all sorts of you know, uh, areas. Um, as an industry, we're terrible at lobbying. If you actually look at the, uh, there was an education review a few years ago, and you know, the, I don't know the, who the, the lobby for geography teachers is, but they did a really good job. Like their submission was 40 pages of like why geography should be taught you know, in high school syllabus. And like, well, I've got Google Maps on my phone now. I'm not sure that's as relevant. Like, and the history teachers had a 100 page submission. And the, you know, the software industry had like three pages. <laughs> um, it's just because we don't interact with government. We like don't depend on them for handouts, so we haven't built a lobbying uh, function. You know, whereas like a lot of the other ones, really if the government said no, they wither and die, right? So they've actually built that, that sort of relationship. Um, I think that'll change over time as technology becomes more important. We need to play a bigger um, role in lobbying. Um, and not, not sort of lobbying, I mean, the pejorative sense, but like, hey, making sure that like, people understand what we have and the jobs we create and the things that we do. And hopefully ACS and others like it are, you know, helping along that way. We've got time for three more questions. So we'll start with the third last up here. Hello, <coughs> my name's B. I work at UNSW. Um, you spoke about your giving earlier on this evening <laughs> and I was just wondering, what is it for you that makes you kind of tick and go, yes, I want to give to that, I believe in that cause? So for many people, giving is attached to like a personal, you know, like someone was touched by cancer or someone was touched by that. And whilst I've had all those, I guess my giving is more, um, I mean, it comes down to what brings me, you know, what do I think is going to have the biggest impact in the world? Like for me, you know, I get my enjoyment from impact, uh, you know, and, and sort of how big a um, mark can I make? And so that's where it comes down to education in the developing world, you know, it's sort of a very hyper-rational way of delivering it and it may not be the right wa way, but um, that's the thing that I guess brings me the, brings me the most joy is, is to have that. Um, and when you do go, you know, go meet the people you've impacted, it, it does have a pretty lasting effect. Uh, I remember before we'd ever given a dollar to Room to Read, I went and visited the schools in, in, uh, in Vietnam and it was, you know, sort of five-hour trip out from Ho Chi Minh. You sort of caught a bus for three hours. Then you had to get off the bus and get on a, a raft across a river because there was no road. And you got on a different bus because, like, the, you know, the river was, I guess you had to drive two more hours to drive around the river. And, uh, and then you get to the school. And uh, these four young girls came out and talked to us about their education experience. And there must have been six or seven. And they all started crying and saying, thank you so much for what you've done. Without you, I wouldn't have an education. And um, I've got a seven-year-old now. I can't imagine him crying <laughs> about, like, <laughs> the opportunity I've given him with his education. <laughs> um, and, uh, and part of that I felt really guilty as well because I'd never given a dollar at that stage. And they're, like, you know, falling over, thanking us and crying. Um, so it has an impactful uh, moment. Um, and if you think there's... 250,000 of those, you know, those moments that we've managed to have an impact, that makes me feel pretty good. Um, but everyone has their own, own way. Second last, there? one down here. Oh, we one up the back, okay, thanks Steve. <coughs> Hi Scott, Johanna Pittman. I uh, work at the intersection of cities and startups, so um, I was really interested, and you just mentioned the tech precinct that yep. you've been um, advocating for, which has been fantastic to, to see your weight put behind that. Um, 
next week, Spark Festival's sponsoring Krista Jones from Mars Discovery Precinct. Mm. So we're going to have the fastest growing ecosystem kind of sharing her advice as to what they've done um, in Toronto, as well as um, I'm running an Innovation Districts com uh, conversation at Smart Cities Week. So there's a lot going on in this space. And mm. I guess if there's one thing we need to learn or what, what sort of questions should be we be asking of international people that have developed these precincts internationally, what questions should we be asking of them to make sure that the tech precinct in Central to Everly is a real success? Mm, that's, a, that's a good question. I um, spent a lot of time on this recently. The two things I care about, I'm not sure they're uh, as relevant from international things, but the um, one for me is basically the, the, the Central to Everly is the government has buildings that they, you know, well space, they don't have buildings, they've got space that could be used for anything. And what we're saying as a, as a technology industry is help us subsidise in some way, you know, uh, the rents so we can get a lot of startups in there. And that's what the government's doing at um, Wynyard Green, which is uh, above Wynyard Station. And, you know, the government subsidises, I think I did the back of the envelope calculations, for every desk in uh, Wynyard Green, it's about $4,000 a year the government pays. Um, and if you do the math, you're like, okay, well, you know, assuming like, you know, you can get to an average startup wage of, you know, I like say 80 grand a year, even a very low level, you know, that, you know, I only need one in 20 startups to be even incremental to the economy for it to ROI. So $4,000 to get someone, um, and when you chat with some of those, those areas, like uh, it's actually the availability of desk space and a place to go is a key um, contribution to startups getting off the ground. So in the ROI sense, it feels like it's a pretty good economic argument to say, let's do that. Um, but when you say to government, hey, don't sell the buildings for, you know, a billion dollars, sell them for $700 million, and as a result, we get a huge startup ecosystem, someone still has to pay that money, right? So, I, so the one thing I, my name want to care about is what is the economic model so it's sustainable? So we don't sort of say, right, it's great years one to five, but in year six, like, the guillotine falls and suddenly, like, all the startups disappear, you know, um, and uh, uh, then, then the second one is the ground floor experience, what I'm calling, which is how do you activate a space? Because um, there's a lot of research that shows that cities are more productive. Uh, why are cities more productive? Because um, we have random interactions between people. Um, and so it really is literally random interactions, uh, you know, um, between people drive economic growth in cities. How do you encourage those random interactions between disparate groups of people? Well, that comes down to, well, you know, events like how do you get people like tonight? You'll have met someone in the foyer you didn't know uh, previously. Hopefully, if you don't do that, meet them afterwards. Um, uh, but, you, you know, cafeterias, uh, different events, um, we need to make sure that space works really well um, in, in that tech precinct. And that will be, it won't just be one central hub because, you know, there'll be lots of buildings. So we need to think about how we curate that, that ground floor experience. So those are the two areas I'm spending most of my time uh, focused on. Um, it is funny being on sometimes on these government boards. They're like, yep, yep, top 10 list is we need to have fast internet. <laughs> yeah, no, we do. But surely in five years' time, that's the sole problem in the CBD of Sydney. Like, you don't need to specify that as something that, that needs to get done. Um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, th I'm focused on those two, <laughs> those two areas. Yeah. Okay, last question here, if I could, please. Sure. Scott, my name's Sarah. Uh, I'm currently uh, at Think Place, but this is more of a question coming as a university student. Yeah. Uh, I've been quite interested in the Atlassian journey with your um, response and approach to diversity. Yep. Um, and particularly with the transformation of going from diversity and inclusion to balance and belonging. Um, I'm on the train. You really are, yeah. I'm really into it. Um, but I was wondering, um, what was the, the moment or the, the challenge where you stopped as an organisation and was like, and thought, you have to address this and it's, it's going to become uh, an area of, Im of importance going forward? Yeah. Um, so it just, I've just, from what I've read, I'm like, oh shit, like, <laughs> why are they doing this now? Yeah. What was it? So. Um, look, I think um, that's a really interesting question. You've done, done a lot of research, so I feel like I'm on test now because you've, <laughs> <laughs> you've read like all, you know, like it's like paragraph five of our press release. So you've read it all. So, <laughs> I go, yeah. um, so the thing with um, belonging um, and, and just uh, diversity to use the term that's more, more widely uh, done is that it's probably always been a problem. It's just that there's certain problems that get highlighted at a certain time and it was like, wow, this is a big problem. We should do about it, do something about it. Um, and it happened at different stages, right? Like you go back 
you know, there's the race, pr you know, problem still is in largely in the US, but like, you know, you, for a while segregation was not a problem and then suddenly people, you know, highlight it and like, wow, we should change that. And so over time, I think it's just a matter of, the, of realizing that oh, this is a problem that we have to, have to solve. And then you look and go, okay, hang on, where does it fit in our priority list? And you realize that actually all the research shows um, that diverse teams perform better. Um, we know that it also we used to sell largely, you know, products to software developers and our customer base was largely male. And so you're like, okay, well, that's not as a big deal. Like we're males producing software for males, right? It's, you know, um, but then as we have bigger ambitions to really change the way the whole world works, we're like, okay, well, hang on, that probably doesn't work as well um, as, as it used to. So I don't think there's like a moment in time, um, you know, same as philanthropy or like any of these things that we've done, you just sort of have a realization that, wow, there's, there's a way the world can be better. Um, and we've been on our own journey. I don't say we're perfect in any way. Um, we try and be open and share the, the learnings we have, which is always a bit dangerous because it's much easier to be a closed shop and just say, here's the things we do. It's, it's a little bit more um, dangerous, I guess, or you, know, you put yourself out there at risk of being misunderstood or even just saying the wrong thing. And so we try to take that approach where we go through and explain what we're doing. Um, and so one of the big things we've, we've looked at is um, it's not necessarily the number of, you know, um, Again, diversity in Australia is, is largely men, women. In the US, it's race comes into it a lot, a lot more. Um, we're actually quite race, racially diverse in Australia. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders aside, um, who are underrepresented. Um, and so when it comes to uh, gender, is that a lot of things like, well, well, all my customer service people are female and then all my engineers are male, but on balance across the whole company looks great. And, you know, which is a lot of companies, that, you know, tech companies particularly ha have that. And we said, well, that doesn't make any sense. What you want is every team needs to be diverse because every team makes decisions that you want a diversity of opinion on. And so then we started looking at and reporting on team diversity, how many people have someone that doesn't look like them, at least one you know, minority in, in that team. Um, and so we, we've looked at those numbers. They actually look reasonably good. We've actually been, none of our peers report it, so we can't benchmark. And then we said, well, actually, it's pretty lonely being the only person on a team. Like how many people have you know, two people on a team? At least you know, then you've got two you know, minority, two women, to feel like they're not the only person on a team. So we start reporting on that internally. Um, and then we did surveys and we looked at people and when people talk about diversity, if you aren't, you know, what's typically classified as a minority, you're like, well, diversity, that's not me. Like, I don't feel like that at all. And so we changed it to say, well, uh, you know, um, instead of like, how diverse are we? How, if you get to the sort of one versus two, we looked at how much do people feel like they belong in the team? So it's great to say we're diverse, but if you're the one person that's different, but you don't feel like you belong, that's actually a problem. So we started reporting on belonging internally. So we've sort of been on this journey to try and work out how do we measure this so that we can improve it over a long period of time. Um, and, you know, we've attacked it at graduate level. Our internship program uh, last year, uh, or maybe the year before, was 52% women. So, like, we actually are, you know, y there is actually a pool, pool there we can tap into. Um, anyway, sorry, it's a long, long topic, but it's uh, one I'm passionate about. And there's no, yeah, no one point where we sort of woke up with a light bulb moment. So. Awesome. Well, um, that'll bring the questions to an end. <laughs> um, I, I guess on behalf of everybody, I want to say, Scott, you have been incredibly open tonight, and um, there is a degree of risk in that, but um, that's part of, the, part of your style, your nature. You're a very open person, um, and you've been really honest and, and open with everybody tonight. So um, on behalf of everybody, can we give uh, Scott a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. One last reminder about Pledge 1%. Um, it is something that we are all very passionate about. We really do believe that there's an opportunity for every business to, to bake into the DNA of the organisation, making a difference in the community, giving back. And frankly, the earlier you do that, the better. So uh, if it's something that's of any interest to you whatsoever, there's a few of us wearing Pledge 1% T-shirts tonight. Please uh, come and have a chat. We'd love to tell you more about it and uh, hopefully inspire you to be uh, part of a, an ever-increasing community that's mm. um, putting giving back very much into the core DNA of the business. Um, Andrew, I don't know whether or not you want to say any words at the end? Um, no? Perfect. No? All right. Okay. Thanks, well, um, ACS, thank you very much for, uh, for hosting and sponsoring this evening. It's great to see some of the things that, uh, that ACS is doing these days to, to really make a contribution to the sector. Uh, there's been some seriously big change over recent years and um, it's definitely noticed and it's definitely making a big difference. So um, um, thank you very much. And um, everybody uh, continue to mingle and um, have a, a nibble and a drink. Thanks a lot. Thanks.